Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. With me today is Seth Sandler, developer of the popular tuning app, Tunable. Tunable was an entry point for me into like a whole sort of a category of music tools, you know, utilities for musicians. And, and I'm curious to hear a little bit about like what kind of drove you to making it, because I think that for a, a handful of teachers in my position, which is teaching winds and percussion, the drone feature and then particularly like the just intonation. Tunable is a metronome and a tuner app for anyone who doesn't hasn't figured that out already. I, I imagine most of my colleagues are, are familiar with with the app and have it, le- you know, it's one of like five tuner metronome apps installed on their phone and their and their iPad. But, you know, I, I, I to me, it's like the one of the things that kind of distinguishes it is that it is, you know, part one of the feature sets is like these sustained drones that can be kind of tuned to different tuning systems. And as a someone who directs a wind band at the middle school level, having the ability to model justly in tune intervals for students and then have them play along to them and match them and hear the resulting beats, you know, when they're in or out of tune with them has been uh, a really core part of my teaching philosophy since before I even, like since Dr. Beat was like the only tool I had in the classroom. So, I mean, tunable having that, but also providing like sort of a graphical visual and, you know, representation of the pitch, like sort of in a line, almost a gamified kind of visualization for a student to see has been huge. I mean, I guess if you, we can, we can sort of talk in whatever directions are around the topic of tunable that you want, but I'm curious, just first of all, like, did you, like, what is your musical background? What drove you to make an app with those, you know, a tuner app with those features? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we can start by going super back in time if you want. That's great. I um, love it. Especially considering that you are, you are a, uh, a middle school band director. And um, I think my biggest, my biggest entry point into music was middle school band. Um, nice. <laughs> as, as I mentioned, it is for, you know, many people. I think before that I had, you know, like as a kid, I had the, you know, little tiny piano things that chimed. They were like little analog things. And then I had the little, you know, the light up keyboards that taught you how to play. Um, you know, it, it had a song and the keys would light up. And that's kind of I learned on my own is like a fun thing that my, you know, parents gave me of here, go off and just kind of like learn piano on your own. Um, (laughs) And that was kind of my first introduction, though I would not say that I got particularly good at piano. Um, But that was like, ooh, I like making music. This is, you know, kind of fun. I like this. Um, And then, you know, finally, I so in elementary, though, I, I didn't have an opportunity. There was no music program for me so I I didn't start as early as elementary but as soon as you know middle school rolled around it was okay come to middle school one day and see these instruments and you can play all of them and you know we had the high school kids there that day and you know you got to play every single one and you you know picked your favorite and of course so mine I saw everybody gravitating the cool kids I should say were gravitating to the saxophone and I wanted to, you know, inevitably be cool, or at least cooler than I thought I was. And so I picked saxophone. So saxophone's my, you know, main instrument. Awesome. <laughs> um, and that was kind of my in- very, you know, first entry point to real, you know, actually playing an, a- an instrument. So so it goes back to really the, your so your roots are sort of where I am now, <laughs> just perpetually staying. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that kind of, I'm curious, is that, is that a system that's still in place? Like, do kids come in and get to try out different instruments? How do, how do they pick instruments today? Like, if they're coming new into the program? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's different everywhere. But I mean, in my, I, I would consider the school district where I'm teaching to be fairly representative of some sort of national standard where you start in elementary school, some start in the sixth grade. Uh, for us, it's in the fourth grade. And you do a similar kind of, you know, you have like a, an elementary school teacher who will give you the opportunity to play all of the different instruments, or at least the, some of the, you know, you're not going to try like the baritone saxophone, but you'll try the saxophone and the trumpet and the clarinet and the flute. And, you know, typically you're encouraged to play something that you can get a pretty characteristic sound on with minimal um, effort. And then, yeah. And then you learn that for two years and then in our middle school, at least in my district, it becomes an everyday band experience where you, we do have a sectional pullout program where once a week you just see your instrument group. But yeah, we're just in full band. 
um, usually teaching through the performance of full band music. So, so that's kind of where it comes into play. Right. My, my um, just like for me, and I've said it on the show before, but I'll, I'll say it again because it's you know very true to me, is like the idea of using drones uh, comes just from my student teaching experience where um, the mentor teacher that I had was really focused on audiation and having students develop their inner ear mm -hmm. and the belief that you can't really make a superior sound more than what is the concept in your head. Uh, and so part of that goal of sort of developing that ear, but also the, the physical skill that is required to, you know, make a, a steady, pure, clear pitch, um, you know, that, that was all sort of revolving around it. But at the time he was developing as this practice of like just constant, like having loud, really loud drones. Uh, playing the root of the key areas of all the music in the classroom. So I got to see mm -hmm. that happen and kind of learn the long-term benefits of that. It's a long road, but eventually, you, st you know, the students, even at the middle school level, start to hear these intervallic relationships, you know, on their own. Right. They don't need to be told to tune sharper or flatter. They just start to eventually hear things. Right, right. It's interesting. It, no, it's it's cool just to hear, you know, you know, my, my experience is, is somewhat limited as I'm not a band director, but I have a lot of band director friends. And a lot of my experience is also from, you know, Southern California and how band is taught on, you know, the West Coast. Um, not, not that what you're saying is any different, but it's just interesting and, and cool to kind of hear um, somebody on the, the other side of the, of the states on, on how things are working. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's cool to kind of make the connection. Well, I think it's clear that like, you know, these, these, this category of application is popular enough that like lots of people all over the world, uh, they want them, you know, they want to have this utility. And I mean, I, when I mentioned right. Dr. Beat earlier, it really was, I mean, you needed a $140 piece of hardware back even just 10, when, right. when did they start teaching? Like at this point, you know, I did, I was a student teacher like 13 or so years ago. And I mean, you, there was not another way you maybe you had like one of these giant, like Peterson strobe tuners at the front of the band room or but the only audio source that I knew of was through a, a Dr. Beat you know my, my mentor teacher had actually recorded into um, a computer three minutes of each and every drone on the Dr. Beat and had made a place a play along CD for his students wow every track that's impressive <laughs> yeah every track was a different pitch and now you just download an app <laughs> and you you get all the features of <laughs> A one hundred and forty dollar hardware unit, you know, and it's like you tap on a whim whatever right, note you want. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you know, to leave off where I was, so you know, middle school, pick saxophone, did that. You know, after middle school, my parents said, "Okay, you have to join marching band," and I was like, "What's marching band? I don't know about this thing. I don't think I like it." Um, but they, so they forced me to go. I went to band camp. Hated band camp, but. Um, Ultimately, they were they were knowledgeable enough to know that it was the best thing for me, and that ultimately really shaped kind of the rest of my life. Is is you know staying in marching band, having friends for life, um, bid, you know getting to participate in you know the the kind of the sport of marching band and the competitiveness and having a couple hundred. Our our program was fairly large at you know a couple hundred people, so it was great just to have lifelong friends through that, and then. You know, inevitably, you know, my my friends, I was a, most of my friends were a little bit younger than me. So as soon as I graduated high school, I did what, uh, you know, some kids do, which is I helped then the following year at the school that I graduated teaching sectionals. So doing saxophone sectionals um, and doing some of the marching stuff. And then I after that year and my friends, you know, had graduated, I went on to basically continue to do the next the same thing for the next four or five years teaching at various high schools throughout Southern California doing you know all woodwinds at that point in time as well as marching and even uh, helping on you know writing some drill and getting kind of immersed in the marching band thing right. um, which I really enjoyed as I was kind of going finding my way through undergrad of really what I wanted to do I didn't really know um, but my, a lot of my friends kind of went the music path. And so I started to go that path too. And I, and I was in, I, I, um, I, I went to junior college and, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to probably do something in music, took music classes, you know, had a couple classes, um, where, you know, we have to, where you have to basically sing back the notes, um, and learn solfeggio and all of that. And, you know, my instructor just kept pitching things 
way too high for me, huh. right? And so enough times of cracking in front of the class, I realized that I didn't think I wanted to be a band director, but I wanted, I wanted to do something in music. I just didn't think that uh, I had either the skills or the focus to be, you know, do purely music, especially since I was interested in, you know, technology as well. Um, and that's one thing that I missed too, that's kind of funny is in high school kind of through this, and this brings in kind of the technology aspect is, um, I think my junior year of high school, I was introduced to, you know, a software called Finale, yep. which I'm sure you are well aware of. And it was, I think, Finale 2000 at that time. Um, and my, you know, I was, which is for anyone that doesn't know, although I'm sure your audience all knows what Finale is. It's a software program to write music. But as a high schooler, this was like magic to me because I can, you know, click and, you know, use my mouse and actually put things into a computer and make music. And I was just like blown away. Yeah. Um, so a friend of mine and I, we basically, you know, junior and senior year started writing MIDI music and, you know, I didn't know what I was doing cause I had no real training. He had t been taking piano for, you know, eight years. So his music was, and still is amazing. And we submitted to competitions, um, and he would always win and I would just, you know, get runner up type of thing which was amazing just to watch that kind of unfold. And then the other thing is we would make CDs of our music. CD burners had just come out basically. So that was, you know, really amazing. And, and we would sell them to our friends and our teachers of our little albums of MIDI music, um, which I still go back and, and listen to once in oh, a while. Oh, you kept all that. That's so great. It's funny to just hear. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so my, I mean, my, my early technology endeavor there was kind of, entering things into a computer to make MIDI music. But then we also had a, a website on GeoCities. Mm -hmm. And this is how I learned to code, basically. Yeah. Uh, the earliest part of coding websites on GeoCities to make our website, which, if, of course, you looked at today, you'd be like, you'd be cringing a little <laughs> bit to see this thing. But um, it's just funny to look back on. I had a GeoCities site. It was a Sonic the Hedgehog fan page. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic speaking of <laughs> things that uh some you know you only like because they're i was talking to my wife about this exact same thing in context of, of speed i was like it's in the same way that like later generations think that the modern day sonic the hedgehog is like cool because it was like their thing growing up i'm like this is the same reason why right. to me the 90s stuff is only the good stuff uh i'm just <laughs> it's just what i grew up with but back yeah back then you know i had my i don't remember it must have been when was that a thing like night like the late 90s geo cities I, rem I definitely remember having a sonic fan page um right <laughs> and that was like for me like sort of where i was like curious and like would tweak the html a little bit um but i didn't go too far you know, like i took a computer science class in high school and i kind of learned that there was a point of diminishing return for like what you know i mean every prof in every profession you're trying to figure out what are the kinds of cr problems that i'm going to be engaged in solving in a creative way for a really long time when the rubber hits the road. And for me, uh, I didn't always feel like um, figuring out like where I messed up in the syntax of some text document was that. Um, but teaching sixth graders how to count eighth notes evenly seems to still be cool <laughs> with me at 10, 11, 12 years in. So, <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> So interesting. So it's, so you're coming from all this musical background. So like when, at what point does, do you like kind of start doing yeah. software development? Yeah. So, you know, I, I was going to junior college taking basically the, you know, the first two years on a course of music education. Um, and I basically did all of it. And then I tr ended up transferring because I heard that there was this really interesting new major um, from the University of California, San Diego, called ICAM, which stands for Interdisciplinary Computing and the Arts with an emphasis in music. It's incredibly long, but basically it sounded like, uh, you know, everybody that went through this program was having a lot of fun. They were doing like creative things with both art and music and visuals and lighting and just kind of the whole gamut. 
um, as well as technology and computing and, um, you know, new intersection that just, it sounded interesting enough. And I knew that I think a formal just music education route wasn't quite right for me, especially seeing my other friends who were going that route, who were just loving it. And I loved it in a, just a different way. And so this program felt right to me. And so I ended up doing that. And that basically what it did is it encompassed kind of a little bit of coding. And and majority of that coding was kind of Flash, if you remember Flash websites. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, uh, uh, rest in place, peace, Flash. But I lived a um, long, really that long was a life. big thing for me for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so coding in Flash, but then it was also you know learning you know recording arts and acoustics and visual and sound design, um, and then a lot of it was also I'm not sure if you've heard of uh, the software Pure Data. It's a basically an audio synthesis programming language. I've heard of it, then I have not internalized it. I'm looking it up now. Yeah, it's it's super interesting, very confusing, uh, hard to learn initially, but amazing after. But basically, it's kind of like a lot of uh, you know audio apps today, where you kind of route things from one thing to other with literal lines. Like you kind of draw a line from like you know an oscillator to a uh, you know digital audio converter and that's how you make an oscillator you know go out of your speaker right. and so um pure data is specifically a real-time audio synthesis language meant for audio creation whether it's synthesis recording production kind of a whole gamut of things um and that was taught uh there as well as a lot of other places but the creator of that um miller puckett was a uh, is a professor there. And so that was kind of the go-to thing that they taught students. Um, and that's actually what I use in Tunable, and I can talk about that more later. But uh, that was kind of my intro to, okay, now how does audio get programmed? How do I make a microphone that listens and can tune incoming signals? Um, that was my first experience, uh, basically through learning pure data in college. Um, but I did not have any intention because at that time of creating apps or anything, because at that time there were no apps, right. um, there was no iPhone. Um, so I didn't know that that was actually going to be a path for me. So, so what's next? Like where do you yeah. start? Yeah. Ne so next up is, uh, the very end. So we're, we're very close to getting to tunable. I love it. No, it's good. This is a long, long path to well, tunable. Well, you know, sometimes <laughs> when people who make make tools, you know, are on, it's it's just like all about the app. And like, because this is a specifically right. musical tool, I think it's good that people, you know, and I also, th I think that the people who are, I think there's like a number of people who listen to this show who are curious, you know, I, th I don't think you teach music and then like have an interest in technology unless you're just like deeply curious about things, you know, I mean, so sure. I, I know a handful of teachers who have even pivoted uh, or, you know, other career professionals who have pivoted into software. Right. So I don't know. I think it's, I think this is always interesting to give its perspective because it's like, I know people who are like, I wonder what, what would a pivot look like? And sometimes seeing where the careers cross over is interesting. So I'm, I'm yeah. here for it. I, I will say that I am a culmination of pivots, essentially. <laughs> right. Um, if you look at all the body of work that I've actually done, it, it's kind of all over the place to some extent. But I can draw a line from one point to the next, and hopefully I can do that yeah. here. Um, so basically, in my final year uh, in college, we had to come up with this senior project. And at this point in time, there was, I think the iPhone had just come out. But when the iPhone just had just come out, you know, there actually was no app store. There was no way for independent apps to come out. It was just whatever Apple provided, those were the apps that came with it. Mm. And so that wasn't even the thing that was on my mind at right. the time. Um, but a friend of mine actually showed me, you know, a community online where you could build basically a huge multi-touch device. So similar to, an, imagine an iPhone, but you know, it's 40 inches. It's like the size of a table. And so I decided I was going to be very ambitious for my senior project. I basically had six months to do it, uh, that I was going to build this multi-touch table. And so found this community, became part of the community, helped the community grow ultimately. And we built this, I built this 
large multi-touch device and I created apps for it, um, including a piano that you could take two fingers and actually scale up or scale down. Oh, cool. And so you could make it kind of whatever size you wanted, or you could have multiple people on the screen essentially and, and make it fit your fingers or your fingers too big or too small. And I kind of experimented with that. Um, and a few other audio apps like ping pong that would make different tones based on where it hit when it hit certain edges of the screen um, uh, and, so, and stuff like that. And that was kind of my first kind of initial conceptualization of how can I create, you know, music apps. And right now it's only for this large multi-touch display because that's all I know that exists really. Um, and then, you know, as soon as I graduated, um, one of those apps that I actually created for that table, I ended up porting because the App Store opened up apps uh, for third-party developers. And uh, I ported the code from Flash, which is what I had originally written my senior project on, um, into iOS code. And I launched this app called NodeBeat. And it was basically a sequencer where little circles float around the screen and they connect. And when they connect, they create chimes in the order that they connect, essentially. Um, and I released it to the App Store thinking, hey, you know, if this gets a thousand downloads over the year, that would be amazing. Like that would make it worth the time, you know, to do this. Like that'd be fantastic. And, um, you know, I was just kind of lucky early you know, on the app store that, you know, to date it's done over 2 million downloads. Oh, wow. And so it's, it's been amazing. And, and actually last year I ended up uh, selling it to a company that can spend more time on it. And that's actually really excited to add more features, but that was my first iOS app. I did it just to learn iOS. Um, and it was really just for fun. Yeah. Is learning iOS through porting a flash app? Like how would you to, like is that the way that you would go back and do it if you were gonna like like if you know what you knew now and then back then I guess you had already made it so I guess that's yeah you know it's it's an interesting question I think at the time it was my only option it was kind of like this is what I know and uh, it would have been really hard to learn iOS without some frame of reference of something else um, Today, like the amount of resources to learn any language is just amazing. You know, there's all these Twitter. Twitter exists now. Sure, right? yeah. Um, you have, right. And none of those things existed at the time. So it was like, if you really wanted to learn these things, it's you're talking about maybe a community of like 100 people versus now you're talking about tens of thousands of people that can help and contribute. And it's, I think it's way easier to learn right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, okay, so you so you make this app, which and I and I remember. I mean, being fairly early to the iPad, I remember you know downloading that app and and, and thinking like, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, music. I mean, and, and this is one of the things is like touch. You know, the <laughs> having a full you know like a just a touch screen that can sort of adapt to anything, you know, opens up all these sorts of possibilities. Um, out of curiosity, you know, I know that like what, speak, just speaking of technology, I know that like Apple has, you know, like uh, UI kit and like Swift UI. These are things that I sort of like kind of follow, but I don't dedicate too much time to keeping up with them uh, beyond like how they influence my own experience with the apps <laughs> that I use to get my work done. Mm -hmm. um, but like, do, are those are those tools, do you feel like are they useful to developers of music software where like kind of you're not dealing with like list views and hierarchical kind of like systems like that? You know, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have a good good answer of what like the greater community thinks. And I'm it's something I haven't actually studied quite yet. Um, for example, the Swift UI stuff which is basically Apple's way of making it a little bit more visual and easier to build apps in the way that um, instead of writing code, that's a little code can be kind of cryptic. Uh, the Swift UI stuff is more visual in nature in that like I, if you wanna have you know, some text on the screen, you could literally drag and drop a piece of text and you could see that it's kind of forming what it'll actually look like on your device. And so 
that's really that's really um, great and interesting, and it makes things a lot easier to learn. And I think also maintain, which is something that you know developers um, want a lot too, is the maintainability of you know in a year from now, is it going to be hard to maintain right, this? Right. Um, so I think Swift UI brings a lot to the table, but at the same time, you're right in that a lot of audio apps specifically have really custom you know, interfaces. You know, they're not kind of out of the box things that iOS provides or Android provides if, you know, for Android stuff. It's usually, you know, here's a, a knob that looks like, you know, a physical knob that you would expect on an actual speaker, right? right? And that's not something that Apple provides. You actually have to build. So I, I don't know if there's a lot of adoption right now with Swift UI on the audio side of things, like you're saying, especially if it's more custom interfaces and not lists of items. Um, I haven't seen that happen thus far. Sure, yeah, and I feel like the more, um, you know, the more expensive and professional a music app is, and the, the wider your audience is, the more you sort of have to try to be like maintaining this sort of cross-platform compatibility. And I know that there's a lot of, there's a right. lot of platforms that allow someone to use one set of code and then have their thing many places. But one of the things that's, um, you know, about like, just, you know, for me as an iOS user is I can sometimes like tell when an app is not taking advantage of those system, you know, tools that Apple has provided because maybe like something just doesn't scroll just right. Or maybe like there's like, uh, you know, just something moves or animates in a certain way and the experience maybe just does not feel like quite as native. Um, but then there's always this like juggling of it's like, well, but I would also, there's like software I'd also rather have on iPad or iPhone period than not have. So I accept some of these, some right. of these compromises. Um, I feel like I had a, that was going to be a question and then I lost the question. Part <laughs> of it. Um, that totally happens. <laughs> let me just fine. I'll, maybe I'll come back to it later. I mean, let me, let me sort of just bounce to like the specific features of tunable and kind of coming back to these drones. Like what, what yeah. made you like what made you decide that the sustained drones and like the tuning systems were going to be a part of the app and then like i guess if you could comment like what like, i guess who who did you think was the target audience of that when you were when you prioritizing those things and then has as you've received feedback yeah. from people i mean you know you, you said you know some people who teach music like has the feedback sort of like changed your priorities or like changed the direction you've gone with it since you launched it like tell me a little bit about that yeah so it's 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 actually interesting and um to hear because i actually hear this quite a bit now maybe not so much in in the earlier days of when tunable was was first launched about the drones because um i say that because tunable was originally um the insight that i had was that uh i was building you know a tuner app and doing the research it seemed that all of it, all the existing tuners including hardware tuners had this issue where um they were great for instruments that were um that as soon as you basically tune each string it's in tune right, right. so a piano a guitar right all of those as soon as you get it in tune if you play the note it will it should you know if it's a quality right. instrument it'll it'll maintain it in tune right however i was but the issue is that wind instruments or string instruments like violin etc where that's not the case where you know for violin like hand position and how you hold it and how you um you know your how you're bowing uh and or if you're a wind instrument how your embouchure is and maintaining as you're playing the note is equally as important as getting is just putting you know your fundamental note in tune right um and so the the and the insight was that it should have basically a graphical representation of tuning over time so it's not a point in time in the sense that i can play an a and you're going to tell me whether the a is in tune at this exact point in time that it's hearing it which is valuable, but not as valuable as can you hold out that A over time and stay in tune, which would then illustrate, okay, are you breathing correctly? Is your embouchure staying in, you know, 
consistent, all of those things. As your dynamics change, you know, and you get louder and softer, are it, you know, are you getting uh, less, are you getting sharp or flat in any other way? And a tuner that just has a single needle, while it tells you that, you can't really visualize that it's happening. Um, and so the insight was really, the initial insight was, okay, it makes sense to have a tuner that actually has a wavy line of history that says over the last 10 seconds or X amount of time of playing, here's how you're staying in tune. And the straighter that line is, assuming that you want it to be straight and that you're not, you know, pitch bending right. or anything, uh, that that's that's as good as you can be doing in terms of maintaining your ability to stay in tune. Um, but I, over the time, I, I have heard more and I see more demonstrations of people using um, the tone generator to do chords and to listen to, um, you know, the pulses that you hear when things are a little out of tune and all of that. That wasn't an initial in intention. It was more, I know that people want to be able to play single notes, like a tone generator already exists on tuners today, uh, on physical tuners, right? And so I knew at minimum it needed to, to be able to support a single pitch. And then I also knew just from my own experience of, you know, in band of, of wanting to be able to fit into a chord structure of, you know, being able to play, you know, three notes and be able to say that you're going to fit into the triad of that um, and, and sustain in tune. And so I knew that it needed to support, um, you know, chords essentially. But that was kind of, it wasn't really more in depth, at least at that in the initial inception point. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's awesome to, to hear that. So like what, okay, let me, we can fill in anything else you want to say about any of that Sure. at any point. I'm just going to kind of like keep it moving and just ask you, like I, I've sort of, um, I guess if, to, to the degree that you feel comfortable commenting, like what are sort of like just sort of taking that into the future like what are things that you continue to hear people request that sort of change your perception of like how it's being used that you think like are you know what are they what is kind of like your wish list some major things you think maybe you would want to add to the feature set yeah so one thing one feature that actually exists today that um i don't know that a lot of people know about and so this is one that i actually would like more feedback on because i think this could be taken in a lot of directions, but Tunable is a tuner, uh, which has a tuning history, like I just kind of uh, went um, described. It has a tone and chord generator, right, which you've been um, referencing. And then kind of lastly, it has kind of a two part, which it has the ability to record, pretty standard. Um, but on top of that, each recording also gets um, essentially a score if you want it. And so what this score does is it, well, it takes the recording and it spits out and says, for what we heard during this recording, you were 70% of the time you were in tune. And then it kind of breaks down each note. And it says for your C sharp, you start in tune and then you sustain in tune and then you release a little bit flat your tendency is a little bit flat when you're playing c sharp and it'll do that for each note um and so i've gotten a lot of um not a lot but i've gotten some feedback that people really like that so much so that unfortunately i don't have it on android yet and so i know it's something people want because i get a lot of requests from android users asking why it's not supported yet um and that's something that i'm i'm working on um but that's one that I don't know people n know specifically about, and I probably need to surface better. Um, I'm curious if that's something that you find, have, have tried out at, yet or have any experience I with. have, yeah. So it's, but it's like sort of usually either as a demo or for like really in like very formative feedback. This, you, you're, you said talking about that makes me tempted to go on a tangent. So I'm going to indulge myself. You, th this kind yeah. of technology, particularly like the just intonation part is like, so obviously like there's a couple of apps on the app store that like have this technology. And then like in the mu in music education, we also have these applications that take, um, 
you know, act, like musical notation, uh, like music XML or like MIDI files or um, professional recordings of concert band orchestra choir literature and then have you sort of like in a web app, a student can like play their part along to this professional recording and then get like a note accuracy um, and rhythm and in some cases pitch score. And uh, I, you know, it's funny, I had a conference I presented at once. I asked, uh, um, you know, some, who, someone who was on the showroom floor representing one of these companies who will remain nameless. I asked if they thought that like adding intonate, like making intonation a more integral part of the feedback system of this platform was important. And they were like, well, why would you want to play in tune? And I just like, <laughs> at that point, I didn't know. How to, I, I, I kind of froze because I was like, I can't believe that you said that. I don't. I don't know how to even like address that, but like the, the technology right. is, is all here. It's just sort of all like not in the same place. And I guess I just, yeah, I just had to like share that with you. Cause like, I, at some point I would, I would love for somehow at some point for what you're doing to be like, I know you're not going to like build a platform that we're in like license young band literature to people and then anal- analyze uh, this stuff. But I guess, I don't know you, that, that to me is sort of like the ultimate, um, vision I have of where this can go. But as far as like the feature you're mentioning, um, to me, it's great for just like pop popping up on a display, like a projector in the classroom and then showing, you know, having each student play uh, and then just sort of giving them some like in the moment feedback. Uh, and then of course, encouraging them to use those features when they're at home practicing. Uh, I obviously can't, well, I guess I could, if I wanted to, I could put like formal grades in a grade book based on it. We have our own, I won't get into this unless you really want me to, but we have our own system for how we kind of like, formally more formally assess intonation in our program uh sure. and it's it's supported by this kind of drone based practice um but we don't use any of these tuning kinds of tools f- as the actual assessment grade if that makes sense yeah no no that that does make sense i think it would be great um we should catch up even after, because I know that would be a conversation in and of itself. But I would love to to learn more about how you do assessments and if there's tools that you're wishing, or even the audience, if, if there's tools that you're saying, ah, oh, you know, I wish I wish I only had this, um, because it, there's I would say there's nothing off the plate for me right now. I have a lot of, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what comes top to mind while I while I'm speaking right now, but. Uh, there are a lot of varying kind of degrees of ways I've thought, you know, tunable can go, but it's also, you know, I don't want to bring it to a place that goes too far out of where it is. If there isn't a lot of people asking right. for it in the sense that, um, you know, especially when you have an app that represents like a couple core features that people are used to. So tuner, metronome, recorder. Like the more than you add, like, you know, social sharing or <laughs> assessments or, you know, video sharing to Instagram. Like once you add kind of these other layers on top of it, um, you know, you get you end up in, a, in an interesting place in terms of what the audience starts to think about it. Um, and so, you know, there kind of has to be solving a need before I, I kind of go that direction. So I'll say, first of all, that there's nothing I love more than abusing my platform to make feature requests live on air. So <laughs> I, I do have do. a few Please things. Do. I want them. I, I have a few things maybe that, that I'll share, but, I, but I'll preface them by saying I do, I do actually think that Tunable, is, that one of the strengths is that it is somewhat more minimalistic compared to some of the other apps that do like these kinds of features. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. also feel like in some ways I, I is respectful of the, I have never used the Android version of the app, but it feels to me like respectful of some of the iOS paradigms. I, I just feel, I feel like I'm using an app that like feels a little more at home uh, on, on an Apple platform. So it feels comfortable to me to use. Um, there are certainly other tuner and metronome apps that I like that have a lot of power, but, Yes, definitely yeah. at the expense in some cases of like there's just so many things on screen that maintain sustaining some sort of intelligible design is like not the case always. So um, I don't know. I have some I guess there's like if you want to know those like deeper, more underlying features that would be like the core th- functionalities. Uh, I can get to those in a second, but I have some like really superficial ones that I'd love to share first. Sure. <laughs> Only because I saw yeah, you you do. were sharing on Twitter the other day uh, a widget. <laughs> that was a piano it was like a, oh yes. and you would tap it and and i saw that and i was like you know i don't there's so few 
um, of my music tools, a lot of my productivity apps that I do use to be a teacher, but a lot of, you know, so few of my music tools take advantage of those kinds of, I don't know, like how to define them other than like sort of like sexy new iOS platform feature. You know, I mean, like last year, uh, the widgets were a big thing. And I can think I can talk about, I've talked about widgets on the show before, and most people know because they're decorative, you know, that you can put them right. down. So you, you kind of put this proof of concept on Twitter of like a piano widget that lives on the home screen and then you tap a key and then it launches tunable, plays that note, and then, but then you're doing, I think there's like a hacky way where because it's like widgets don't, can like open the app but technically not close it but i think you were like doing some trickery to make it like close the app so that you went back to the home screen afterwards is that right yeah that's that's exactly right so you you tap you basically tap a button on the widget which whenever you tap a button on any widget apple apple enforces that the app actually opens um like fully at full screen kind of the app comes into the foreground and so you know i'm hacking it by basically saying once the app opens, immediately it just closes. Yeah. To go back to the right, media. exactly. So I'll I'll just put it out there. Whether or not that hack, it, whether or not you ever implement this, with or without that hack, I would just like to say that like I don't have any tuner apps, other than maybe like I think Fourscore has like a widget where you can like tap on some buttons that make some tuning drones. But it, what what I would what I would love is I'm working on because um, we'll get to my tech of the my tech tip of the week later. I'm, I've been playing around with yeah. the, the beta software for um, the iPad. And I've been, uh, you know, running the running iOS 15 on it. Um, and I am, to play, so there's this new, you know, feature coming out where you can like sort of basically design your own do not disturb modes. Um, you can say like, okay, I'm gonna create a do not disturb mode called like work. And this means, you know, during this mode, you define who, this is for my audience, I know you know this, but <laughs> so you can define, who can contact you and which apps can notify you. So for me, I'm working mm-hmm. on a rehearsal do not disturb mode that basically allows only my wife and members of my music team to send me messages and then only app only notifications from Slack, which is our team communication tool for my music team. And <clears throat> one of the things you can do with these modes is when you put it in that do not disturb mode, it can totally change what your home screen looks like. And so I'm building a rehearsal home screen that has just apps I need in band and, and then more importantly apps i don't need <laughs> while i'm teaching band like twitter goes away so you know it pops some tuner and like metronome things on the screen when i do this but what would be really interesting is since the iphone is often the device i pump these drones through is if like i could have like a widget with customizable because like there's specific sounds that i use more often than others like i really often use like a euphonium or a like a horn like a b-flat like two three four and then like a clarinet b flat three four five i don't know how if this is feasible but some widget that basically has customizable little tap targets to uh so that's that's dream feature number one that's that's a <laughs> free i don't know how, how feasible is that i don't know is the widget thing just too cumbersome with the tools provided no i think it's feasible i i will say that um there basically a similar feature not tunable specific was had been on my mind although I, I I push it up this was this was a uh, thing for Clubhouse when Clubhouse people were are you familiar with Clubhouse? Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, so I well I had I had a I, I don't think I'm the first one to do this because I think I've actually seen it and that's kind of why I decided I don't need to do it which was um, Clubhouse people were playing basically sound effects uh-huh. right if they were hosts they could play sound effects so. I was like, well, there should be a really easy way to just put sound effects right in a widget. And so you would assign the sounds to buttons on a widget. And, you know, while you're in Clubhouse, you can just, you know, play with these without having to open a full app kind of thing. Um, But that's basically what you're describing. And it'd be, you know, something in in Tunable to support the same thing of saying, I want these buttons to play these sounds. That's, That's completely feasible. My second one actually would even eliminate the need for you to even build that which is actually you might th- this might be a thing and i'm just not well researched Th- are there any siri shortcuts actions built into tunable there's a few okay. there's um so you can tell siri to start the metronome at a certain tempo and you can tell siri to play a uh a pitch a single pitch um and you can say what note you would like although i don't you can't say what octave because siri is kind of limited in terms sure. of 
follow would there us. even if siri was not the input method would there be is like is it technically possible to have it choose the octave because that's totally i've got so I'm, I'm working again like i said my band focus mode currently changes my home screen yeah. but you can also i'm going in the rabbit hole sorry listeners you can have a focus mode trigger a siri shortcut and i have one that i have developed that opens four score on one half of the screen and good notes on the other half which is like kind of a i use it as a whiteboard when i'm teaching right um and what would be super cool is if like a third or a fourth step could be to play a specific drone or drones in an octave for the warm-up because then i because then you can put there's like a widget for short for running shortcuts then i could just plug my shortcuts into that widget and then you don't even have to make a widget you just use the, the shortcuts widget Right, I like that. That's something I can look into. Okay, yeah, I would, I would be I like st- stoked to do to do things like that. Totally. <laughs> I love these. I mean, this to be honest, I, I don't get as many feature requests as you might imagine, and I think, um, and that might be just because you know there's kind of a segment of the population of tunable users that purely are kind of using it for like the base level features in the sense of, you know. They want to tune their instrument. As soon as it's in tune, they kind of shut the app and that's it. They're using it as a metronome, so they'll use it whenever they need a metronome. Um, less people use it for recording just because it's more advertised for the, the tuner and metronome. Um, and then, of course, there's a, you know, a larger, po- a, a medium-sized population that's, okay, now they leave you know, the tuning part uh, up all the time, right? So they could always see the tuning history and they're more maintained. It's not so much just tune my instrument once and then go away. It's like, no, it's on the music stand right next to the sheet music and they're kind of watching it as they're playing. Um, and then you have, you know, the third group, which I think is even a little bit smaller, but you have a lot of people now that I've been seeing, at least on social media especially, is doing what you're, you've are you been talking about, which is integrating with the drones. Especially I see a lot of violinists uh, you know, um, basically a lot of string players, uh, that are showing, like putting two, two drones on, trying to fit their sound in the middle, you know, listening, see how that fits in. Um, and, and that's really awesome. And then, you know, of course there's the power users that are one step, you know, above that, which are using like the Siri shortcuts and stuff like that. Yeah. They're definitely like these kind of, um, iOS centric features, but what's cool about them is that, especially with shortcuts is then it allows you to, as a user to sort of build features of the app that might not already be there. Um, and right. that's kind of what I like about them. I, I was thinking recently, why are, cause someone asked me at a conference, I was talking about shortcuts and they were like, do, how, do, how practical is this actually for music teaching? And I was like, well, it's really like sort of adjacent to it. Like I can do things around, I can't like do my core work with it. I can't automate my core work, but I can sort of like automate little tiny bits here and there and one of the reasons for that is because a lot of the music tools don't support it but um you know but but in the ways that they do you can sort of like hack together uh your you know your own workflow i don't know it's interesting it's it's so it's just one of these things where i don't know what what a good metaphor is because it's like now now that i'm sort of processing in real time like other like professional music apps things like pro tools sibelius finale like these are yeah. not things that really have ever integrated with um, the, the deeper automation features of the Mac. Uh, so I don't know. There's, there's no, right. there's no real history of it, of it being there, but I can say definitely as a nerd band power user, I might be one of two people who would use it to be honest, serious, more <laughs> deep serious shortcut support, <laughs> but I would definitely love to see it if you're interested. I mean, I will say that people do, uh, it's not a ton of people, but it is definitely enough people to have made it worth building. Like just the ser- like literally saying, Hey Siri, play a concert A, like, which is funny because now my Siri just came up on my MacBook here. Um, <laughs> but uh, enough people have done it to justify building it, and actually nobody really asked for that. That was more of, hey, this is something that I would like. I don't really want to have to pick up my phone to tell it to start the metronome at a certain speed. Like, why should I be doing that? Um, I think another one that's actually. I'm curious if you've ever used, I think probably not at the middle school level, because I imagine that kids in middle school don't all have phones. Um, (laughs) But Tunable does have uh, the ability to sync metronomes as well. So if, 
you each have tunable on your own device, it'll actually sync the metronome together. So you could, if you're using the visual flash of the metronome or the audio, it'll actually play them all in, in the right speed. So you can have your, your phone on your music stand where that you're looking at, and it'll be uh, playing in the same tempo as, as the rest of them, which is actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, is that, does that require them to be on the same Wi-Fi network? I think it also, it's either Wi-Fi, but I think it might also work over Bluetooth. I'd have to double check. Yeah, okay. I've got to think of some creative uses for that. I'm sure that there are some things, some problems I can solve with but, that that I haven't really like conceived of yet. Um, here's one for you. This is why, though, I would encourage just, you know, you and, and your audience. I think a lot of people don't know that you could just reach out to developers. You know, I think a lot of times... Um, it is true that certain developers just won't respond, but when they do, um, it means that a lot of your ideas might actually come to fruition. And I think a lot of people are just discouraged or are used to like big companies and thinking, Hey, if I, if I send an email to Apple, like I'm never hearing back. Right. Um, and I think it's a little bit different in the iOS app world and even more so I would say in the iOS music world, because the vast majority of music apps on iOS and Android um, are really by solo or very small teams, yep. meaning that there's just one developer behind it or it's just a few. It's not actually a big company. Um, and so it's actually a lot easier to reach out and say, you know, this is an idea. I wish it, it this existed. I don't know if it can exist, but it'd be really cool if it did. I would use it. Um, because it, it's it's one of the easier things to reach out and give um, you know feedback on. Yeah, yeah, totally. I I agree. I the interactions I always have with developers of, of music and some productivity apps are always positive. Thing and I and I feel like I do. Yeah, I, I mean, in many cases I have you know the opportunity to share my experience and influence things. I'll even say a, say a quick antidote. I I don't remember if I said this in a recent recording of another episode that hasn't come out yet, but. I'll, whatever, maybe this is the second time I'm saying the story. Um, even sometimes Apple responds. I, I filed a bug for sure. iOS 15, and I promise that I, I would love to know if there's anyone else in the whole entire world that would actually encounter this problem. This is why I think they responded, because I'm a, like a weird edge case <laughs> power user when it comes to smart speakers. And I was trying to use the new feature, so you can use a Mac as an AirPlay 2 destination in the new forthcoming update. Okay. So what I was right. what I did was I was tried to send a stream uh, from my iPhone to a HomePod, to a Sonos speaker and to a Mac running the new, you know, the beta of the forthcoming operating system. And and it worked, you know, you can group the speakers and the and the music comes out, it's like magic. It comes out all speakers in sync. But one of the things you can do if you have a HomePod is you can put uh, you can stream Apple Music directly to the HomePod. Like the HomePod can be the source of the audio stream, so that it's actually the HomePod that's streaming the music to whatever other group of speakers. So I tried the same scenario, only the HomePod one of one of the HomePods in the house was sending the audio stream to a couple of other smart speakers, and when I was trying to send to the Mac Mini, in that scenario, it would not join the speaker group so very 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 right. small number of people would have that issue but that's how i typically it, listen to music in the house is i have like a home pod beam it out to as many other speakers as i'm as i want so i was like yeah i mean my mac and how did they respond to they that? were like yeah we want to fix this um can you please send screenshots and like a diagnostic report on each in device that's involved and i was like hooray cool okay that's great so yeah it's you have an opportunity to definitely you know uh, influence that process. Um, so for sure, I would just also add, um, because so many of these people are just single developers or small teams, uh, be nice to them. Is, is all I would add. <laughs> <laughs> be nice. <laughs> it's so I'm learning that it's so much easier to, to be nice. Than to, well, sometimes it's harder to be nice than to complain on Twitter, but, um, I get further. <laughs> when i more carefully it's 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 true 
I really do. <laughs> like, it's not helping anyone for me to, other than just me having a good time if I, like, just blow some steam on Twitter. But it's, like, actually, you know, meaningful change can happen if you, like, formulate your words. Take enough of an extra minute or two to just formulate your words, you know. Um, right. <laughs> I'm saying this from the perspective of someone who's, like, currently beta testing a handful of things and thinking to myself, like, wow, I'd really like a couple of things I'm beta testing to work this way. And I know that it's not going to be helpful mm. if I communicate it as aggressively as I feel it viscerally when the thing doesn't work <laughs> the way I want it to. Right. Yeah. That's that's always a that's always one of the you know developer early company you know companies that are testing beta products of when should we actually let people see this because you know uh, it it is hard to know sometimes when is this actually a beta thing versus like oh is this actually going to end up being this right. Way? Right. Um, question. So speaking of like things that leverage the operating system, um, the, I don't have a, in my life one of these new M1 Macs, but I know that iOS apps will natively run on them. Does Tune? I haven't even asked around any of my friends who have one. Does Tunable run on an M1 Mac? Um, I don't think it does right now because I don't think I have it checked to. Although I will say it will... So it, sorry, it won't in like the special way that M1 Max can run uh, native apps. However, it does because there is actually a Mac Store version of Tunable. Did I not? Um, that's a universal version. So I would suggest if you haven't had a chance to check it out, check it out because um, it's new within the last I don't know seven eight months, a year or something like that. Um, maybe less. So it's hilarious that I just just asked track. you this question because I I'm in the app store right now and I this is installed on my computer. So I don't even know why I asked you this question. Um, I perfectly okay. <laughs> but what's what's the craziest thing about this is I must have just like mentally sort of like shelved it. I was like I will think about process this at a later time. What's funny is that the the metronome app I use. Okay, so the reason I asked in the first place is that metronome apps are super important to me on the Mac because it's typically the thing in my either in my studio or my classroom that's hooked into the loudest speakers. So, and right. and also like keyboard, you know, finer degrees of con keyboard control can typically help me to get around a little faster. Um, so the one that I use most often is just for whatever reason it just even though it hasn't been updated in forever it is still working fine on the latest version of Mac OS. It's called Dr. Batati. Okay. And I'll just say to anyone, anyone listening should totally check out Tunable on the Mac, but Dr. Batati is, is if you just also need something that's a specialized metronome, pretty good app. I don't think it's been updated in at least six or seven years, but it runs pretty well. It's I'm got to check that out as well. Yeah, it's good. I like the keyboard shortcuts. You can use like the letters on the keyboard to toggle on and off the different, um, eight, like the eighth note, the sixteenth note, and the triplet, and then each one has oh, like you can that. control the volume all from the keyboard. I, I love it. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I'm just I had to I had to actually it was like had the little cloud icon, so I technically didn't have it installed. Um, I guess I'm an advanced. Sorry, I'm clicking through the the load uh, <laughs> the onboarding screen here. No, that's it's it's <laughs> yeah, it's probably because. You already have Tunable, and so it's a universal purchase, meaning if you've purchased it on iPhone or iPad already, it'll work on Mac. You don't need to repurchase for Mac. Um, so it, App Store is probably just recognizing that you you own this thing, um, and you haven't actually installed it quite yet. This is great. This is super responsive to window resizing, and it has like a nice toolbar and... Okay, I gotta, I gotta start use, trying this out more in my lessons. The thing is, is that I use, in, but since my lessons are percussion lessons, I use more just metronome uh, in them. But though I do use right. uh, drone pitches sometimes for timpani tuning. Yeah, well, you know, one thing is, so I mean, speaking of features and improvements and things like that, you know, there's there's the bigger, you know, ideas, right? But then there's just the kind of how can you make things incrementally better? And you know, the metronome when it first came out was really around how can this be very easy to consume? Like, how can you make it stripped down enough where it's really just performing like a minimal set of things that you really would need, like from a very simple metronome that doesn't have like buttons in every single direction and things to distract you. Um, but I do know at the same time that the metronome can be improved and it can you know, start to have some some more feature sets on on top of where it is. So, 
as you start to use it, feel free to let me know if, you know, if you were like, hey, this is the thing keeping me from using Tunable as a metronome. Um, those are great things that for me to take The fact away. that it's in active development is huge. Um, I, I, let me just... <laughs> yeah. I'll just put this out here, out there. I, one thing that is really helpful for young students, and I think there's only two. Well, you're, see, I'm I'm like revealing how poorly researched I am on this tunable Mac. So Mac app. So you're gonna maybe you're gonna tell me this is already a feature. In yeah. which case, I'm I'm glad I'm asking either way. So one of the things that's that's only in like a couple of apps that I'm aware of is uh, a feature where you can change the sound of the counting to an actual human voice you know, voicing the numbers. Yep. And this is great because I don't, I don't know, like all of us, especially percussionists, because our mouths are free. We're always always told, you know, like count out loud when you play. And I was told this almost yep. dogmatically when I was a student. And it, the, the truth is, is that it's a, not always helpful to do, but um, B like part of the reason for that is just to have a sense of like where in the beat you are. Uh, and what I found is far more effective than having students count out loud, although counting out loud does put your body into it in a way. Um, but what, what's more effective in my experience is this metronome feature that I sometimes use on a couple of my apps because it actually says one, you know, one and two and three. If you have like the eighth note subdivision and it's in four, four, right. one and two and three. And so that's that's a pretty that's a pretty useful one. I don't know. Does it do that now? And I'm just like ignorant or. <laughs> no, first of all, I like that. I like that a lot. And I'm, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. That's actually on. I do have a list of potential features that is on the list of potential features so we, I don't have that right now I will say that it, it's not as good as what you're describing but you can hack around it in the sense of if you want to know where you are to some degree although not you know is to the degree that you're describing is you can set a different sound for the downbeat of the measure um, versus the subsequent uh, note so the downbeat can have a sound the uh, beat can have a sound and the subdivision can have a different sound. So you can basically choose three different sounds, although none of them right now are currently voice. And that's because I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do voice, especially supporting um, like different languages and whatnot. Yeah, and one of the hardest things about it and, and not all the apps I've tried implement it well is, is making it sound natural not like just like a sam samples that kind of awkwardly cut in and out um but like right. you know that like it, i don't know i don't know how how you how you'd manage it but like just having you know whatever the whatever crossfading magic is being triggered to make the word one sound like it's naturally concluding before the word two comes out is something that isn't always right. consistently nailed but yeah that, that's a that's a <laughs> For sure, a, a cool feature. Yeah, I mean the things I would, you know, so this is this looks great. I'm gonna definitely play with this. Um, I guess for me and a Mac app, the keyboard, you know, having basically being able to control it all from the keyboard, is is pretty good. I like this little sliding yep. um, that you can just kind of like scroll, two finger scroll through the tempo here. That's cool. And then I'm at. I do need. There are a few shortcuts, but there aren't too many. So let me know what you're looking for. Um, in case in case you start to use it, you need more keyboard shortcuts. Um, I've been adding them as I've been uh, getting requests for them. Cool. I think so for me, and, and this is the way that I conduct myself just in because I do I, I do a lot of both coding as well as product design and usability and UX stuff outside of Tunable specifically and you know from the day to day work and and the best thing for me and just in general it, for um, developers as as they're thinking about things is really to understand the reason behind things is, is that will help us inform kind of what the best way to go about thing is. So for example, uh, if you know, if you were to write and say, Hey, I wish that, uh, the metronome had a one, two, three, four voice. Can you add that? I would say, okay, like that's something I can consider, but it's much more valuable to hear, you know, I teach percussionists. And the reason that it helps to do a voice versus just a, a sound that's the same for all of them is this. And so I, I get more context and, okay, this is actually the problem that you have. Let me also think of whether there's other solutions or the one that you're describing might be the best. Because maybe actually you come and you say, here's the things that I'm dealing with and I can think of a better way for whatever reason, right? That maybe that 
hasn't crossed your mind and then you're you, you know you end up with a, actually a better experience or maybe it's something that doesn't just help you but it helps other people that have similar things but not quite the same thing so i think for us it's really about you know what is the problems that you're having and then we can kind of together think through okay what are the options of solving that maybe we can actually come up for better or maybe actually what you're describing is exactly the right way yeah to do i it. appreciate that attitude so much because what i often hear is like sometimes people want the software like kind of flipping what you said around like sometimes the user needs to understand how the software works and why it does things and, and to some extent i i do understand and appreciate that but what i appreciate more is, is that you are looking at the fact that like the user experience is valuable like there's a reason i mean you know before even the app store existed there's a reason why people like gravitated to the iphone like it did things in a way that was less abstract um and i think you know when the software can can become less abstract and can, it can get out of people's way it can be more usable and so uh, i respect and appreciate that attitude uh <laughs> because there's so much of the the reverse of that which is that like well actually people should just understand how our software wants to be used and I mean, sure, if someone is like completely misunderstanding like the, the point of something in what they're asking for, I, I get that. But um, but yeah, no, I appreciate the that yeah. I appreciate the transparency, too. I guess this is one of the other things I thought I would touch on and, and just ask you about is like you, you kind of touched on this earlier that it's like cool to have such a huge pool, like such a huge community. Can you speak to that at all? Like what I mean, what is it to how does it feel to to yeah. be to kind of be a part of that community? Yeah, I mean, I will say, first of all, I feel like a tiny, 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 tiny piece of <laughs> this community that you're describing. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting to see over um, probably the last year and a half, two years ish, at least from my perspective on, on Twitter, especially of just um, iOS engineers and developers and people that want to know how to make apps or people just excited to create businesses around apps or have ideas around it really starting to just kind of broadcast what they're doing and you know and then you have a lot of people um uh nicely in a nice way high-fiving each other about like what they're doing and the success that they're doing and really rallying you know for each other um and i think it's super exciting to see um, I feel to me, it's a little weird because I feel really old, um, in that I, I actually find like the people that are new to this, like that are like, some of them are like, there's somebody that I'm following that's 12 years old, you know, and he's, you know, he's, he's released like six apps, uh, has a ton of followers and tweets all of, you know, his progress and whatnot. And there's other people too, that I've talked to, you know. They're 18, they're right out of high school, they're now making, they're doing their own apps and and they're seeing, you know, far more success than I was, is a much quicker rate than I was. Um, and, and it's really amazing just to watch and, to, you know, see everybody around them, like, um, rally in a positive way. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and I love it. And I, I said it earlier and I'll say it again. Like, it's just, it's fun to see the transparency because... Sometimes it's fun to know how, how the sausage is made and to sort of see the, the humanity behind the process and to just get like the inside on it. Like um, one of my, this is not necessarily like, I, I mean, you, I guess you call them indie, but certainly a team of, of larger than one. Um, the Omni Group is a, is a great example of someone who's been like a team that's been making like great productivity apps like OmniFocus has been mentioned on the show like 800 times. And, um, right. you know, I, it's just there. <laughs> but what I like about them is like they don't, hide in the dark on like what features they're adding to the program like they write these blog posts that's like here's what we're thinking and here's what here's the roadmap for the year um and then it's like yeah sure or is it easier to be disappointed when they don't meet the, their goal sure but like i don't know i have so, there's something about that where I, I appreciate that that bit of it you know i'm beta testing their new their new version of omnifocus is coming out at some point and it's like really um like super like like the messiest version I've ever tested of it before but like they have this channel the slack channel for people who are testing and it's just like so much mm. of like people just like ripping it apart and them like very very like graciously like responding and saying hey we hear you like we're working on this we're working, what about this what about this what about this uh, and they respond to everything. Like, I'll say, hey, what about this crazy idea? And they're like, why would you use that? And I say, well, because this, this, and this. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, okay. What if, 
how if it was, what if it was implemented this way? And this is like, you know, a uh, decades old developer who has, I don't, I don't, right. don't want to assume how many people use OmniFocus, but it's, it's a, probably a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 for sure. No, I think there's a whole wave now of um, both, you know, I think larger companies, uh, large companies within the last five, six, seven years have started to understand that users also matter. Yeah. Um, this might not always be apparent, but that users matter. We need to talk to users. User, like, user-centered like design is now a big thing, meaning that as we are building things, keep in mind who you're building them for, and they're like the experts. And it doesn't matter if you like it as an individual at the company. It matters that users like it and they you're solving problems for them. And we're seeing more of that. And we're starting to see like, you know, larger companies do things like bait invites and feedback and be more welcome to stuff. And, and now we're, I think we're also starting to see it now at the individual level of, you know, of individual indies, you know, do the same thing. And, you know, Apple started to really help that a lot by making it easier to have test flight apps and send out apps to people that want to be part of a beta um and and so i think that's kind of why we're we're also seeing that within the last year or so because it's just been easier to do right right. and slack slack as well creating slack groups and saying hey we're gonna have a channel like we really want to build a community of testers and feedback and like the whole loop yeah it's good it's super appreciated on my end i like it a lot (laughs) well i'm gonna move to some segments if that's cool with you sure let's do it so you said tech tech up to the week you just wanted to maybe jump on mine i mean certainly you can Add your sure. own if you want. I, so I'm just like, I'm, I'm going to kind of keep in my theme from earlier. I mentioned I'm on the iOS 15 beta on the iPad and I'm like a, like a getting things done guy. Like, like, sorry, I should, I should say, call it GTD because that getting things done guy just assumes I like to get my work done. But GTD is the getting things done methodology, uh, which, mo- you know, most very, most people who follow it to some degree have this idea of like getting your ideas out of sight, out of mind. And, and for me, I've always had, um, you know, like speaking of OmniFocus, it's a to-do app, but it has an inbox. So you can kind of just dump all of your thoughts there and then organize them later. Um, I have an email inbox. You know, I have I have lots of inboxes. I have in, I need an inbox for my inboxes. I have so many apps where things kind of just get thrown and then I shuffle them around later. Well, I've been experimenting with this new feature on the iPad called QuickNote, where you swipe with the Apple Pencil up from the lower right corner of the screen. And then it sort of starts, to, brings a little little window in the lower right corner but what's cool is that it's contextually aware of what you're looking at so like if you're on a website it'll link the note to that site or if you're at an email it'll offer you to link to that email and i'm kind of just playing around with the idea of like maybe this is my new inbox maybe this is just a way to get everything into the same place and then take those notes if i need to and then kind of just share them to other you know make it make it a ta- you know have it create a task if i need to but then the task can refer to the note um that that sort right. of thing so i don't know i'm liking that i don't know have you tried quick note at all i haven't but i it i started to download it right before uh right before this so i haven't gotten to take it for a spin yet i'm, I'm truthfully not sure if it'll stick it, but it's fun it's a fun experiment it's nice to any kind of ways that technology can draw connections from some kinds of data to others is is neat to me so right right are you a big a, it sounds like you're a big note taker in general yeah i have like four or five apps that could be described as note apps that i'm looking at on the just the doc I'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> i have it's a problem it's not i'm not like really fully satisfied with any of them so speaking of inboxes for inboxes i have drafts which i'm a pretty religious user of which is the, you know for those who don't know, I actually have I, Greg Pierce came, who makes the app, came on the show a couple years ago, and uh, I'll put that a link to that episode in the notes to this one if people want to go listen to that. But it's a it's a text entry app where you can you know send the text to kind of think about get it out of sight, out of mind, and then think about where you want it to go later. Uh, and then there's lots of like custom trigger actions to you know send it to text message or an email or a calendar event. Then I've got Apple Notes, which is for like sort of mixed media, some images, checklists. I have a couple shared notes with my music team. Um, I'm using DevonThink as a research and archival tool. So I clip websites, emails, files, 
into it and sort of organize them by project. And then I, you know, OmniFocus will allow you to link a task to a document that's stored in your Dev and Think database. So if I'm like, sometimes what I'll do is I'll create a, pr a folder in Dev and Think that kind of corresponds to an OmniFocus project and I'll sort of like cross link documents to tasks and sort of like kind of strap together the whole system with duct tape. Uh, and then I have good notes, which is mostly just for handwritten notes um, and PDF annotation. Would you say this is, um, is this primarily for for work or is this both personal? Oh and yeah, work? it's definitely all of these apps get every, get all of me. They just, they just, <laughs> they just get like whatever I, you know, they get all of me, but like I use them for whatever I feel like they're best at doing. It's so like Devin right. think you can just throw tons of documents and web archives and emails in it and it can text search them and cross reference them super well. Whereas Apple notes is just a lot faster to get quick things into. So it's just a slightly better tool for that job. And, and then drafts is just where everything starts. I don't really even leave Got much it. in drafts. It's just sort of like where I type things to get them out of my mind. And then I tap little buttons to, send it elsewhere. And then good notes is only, I mean, I strictly use that for pencil written notes. Got it. There you go. You've, so uh, if, if there were, if there was one tool to rule them all, would you prefer one tool or do you prefer that they're like individual and they have their own kind of cadence of new features and whatnot? I, I don't necessarily prefer having so many things. I mean, you can't really like combine the features of them all without, looking super ugly which is which is kind of the reason why i like something like apple notes which is every mm -hmm. now and then you just need something super clean and simple um devon think right. is definitely comes the closest to doing everything and you can tell i mean you can tell it's got like 800 buttons on the user interface it's it's really a database tool for certain kinds of heavy I, for me it's like kind of an, some people refer to this as the everything bucket where you just if you don't know where it goes just dump it in there and then you can always got find it, it. So, and then I'm playing with Obsidian because that's what the cool kids are doing. <laughs> I'm really, I'm segmenting. I have, there's always something, there new. is always something new. The, this is a, obviously a problem that is as unique, you know, the, like there, there's, there's, there's a known app for every person because like a known app is sort of a digital brain. So ar arguably a task app is too. And there's, a, I've definitely tried lots of task apps. I've tried to doist things, OmniFocus but I feel like I can't, it's a lot harder for me to have my tasks in more than one app than it is uh, referential data. Right. That is, that is, yes, you've, you've, you've hit definitely on a, that was, that was, that's a, <laughs> a trigger spot for me is note. <laughs> How many note <laughs> apps I have? It's, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And I'll, I'll say it's actually really impressive that you're able to manage so many and know which does what um, and which one does it well. Apple Notes. That's, that's pretty impressive. I, I try. Apple Notes is getting better at doing most of it okay. Like the, the one of the main things that now is Apple Notes can finally do is it can search the text in photos and screenshots and images right. and even websites. So it used to be like you could save those things to a note but then you, there's no way to, to find them. And, and one of the things I've used Devon Think for for the longest time is just to throw a picture in there and then it OCRs the text. Right, and I think iOS 15 unlocks a bunch of new stuff related it does to it even. You don't even need to throw it in a note. It just does it to the photos in your photo roll. Right, it's, it's amazing. It's awesome, it's pretty cool. Um, well, I'll do my app of the week. My app of the week is Busy Cal. Speaking of productivity apps, <laughs> I do have a couple of calendar apps, but I try to tend, I, I tend to just have like one that I'm, I, I, I bounce between fantastic Cal and busy Cal. Busy Cal has one thing that I really like. I take lots of notes in the notes fields of my calendar events. Um, I do it with my private lessons. I type their lesson assignment in the notes field, and then I publish a Google calendar version of that to my website where they can be reminded of stuff and uh, busy cal has a permanently visible right sidebar with a notes field exposed so it's like 100 percent less clicking and tapping to take a note 
on a calendar event and for that one i would i would spend whatever i think it's like 50 bucks i would easily spend that on it if that was all it did <laughs> but it does much more than that <laughs> you're the you're the perfect user by the way um <laughs> <laughs> no that's interesting um did you i'm checking it out as well does it, yeah it's good it's good it's like it's you know it's like a typical it's like a power tool um mac app i don't think that the ios version is really very noteworthy but the mac version mm. is, is awesome okay really awesome um did you have one for this category you know i don't have one that sticks out to me um not ones not not one that i think would apply well uh to uh educators or musicians um so uh i'm happy to um tag tag on uh on busy Cal. nice okay it's worth <laughs> checking out definitely it's great all right well i'll, I'll move yeah. on to album of the week um I, I'm actually curious, this will be fun to, to pick your brain about because, you know, we've talked about your band experience, but, you know, not as much like what kind of music gets you fired up. Um, I've been listening to a record by Chris Thiele, who's a, <laughs> have you heard of this guy? Uh-uh. He's um, just a, a, like a, a very, very well-respected mandolin player, and uh, he's okay. played in the group Nickel Creek, has a, a band called The Actually, it's they're not the Punch Brothers. They're just Punch Brothers, and he has a new solo record out that is called Lay Songs, and it is an extremely virtuosic and intimate recording of just him and his mandolin. And the songs are all pretty existential in theme. And he just, I, what I, what I like about it is that, you know, he's the, his work with his bands, I think any, any band who really like has a sound that inspires or changes the way you listen to music. Um, if they don't continuously challenge themselves to reinvent that sound, they're eventually, they're not going to get sound bad. They're just not going to, they're going to sound the same to you over time, you know, like seven or eight out al- radio, you know, seven or eight right. Radiohead albums in start, you know, they Radiohead album starts to not sound that different unless they start to reinvent themselves. And there's a couple of, you know, I use them as an example. Cause it's like, I can think of one or two Radiohead albums where I'm like, okay, okay. Got to try something new. <laughs> and even though they like inspired me when I first heard, okay, computer, you know? So I, I feel like with, with Chris Thiele, you know, he's an artist that I love his work with his larger bands, but I feel like his musicianship is just a little bit unhinged when he plays solo and he's able to do things creatively um, the interplay between some of the technical stuff he does with his mandolin and with his uh, his singing is is super interesting, and I just don't know that it translates artistically as well to the idea of like songwriting in a band. Um, but it really come it really shines in this solo record. So that's that's my thing is lay songs. That's awesome. I'm gonna check that out for sure. So I don't know if you have an album. Sometimes for this category, people don't even, they just say like a song or a playlist or any kind of musical experience is is totally valid for this. I'm trying to, so yeah, I don't, so I don't have a specific album. I'm, I'm definitely a weirdo in that I don't, um, as someone that's somewhat in the music field, I don't listen to as much music as I should and it's probably because I don't like a lot of new music, at least popular music. Um, I will say, I my wife randomly put on the other day, um, it was basically, what was it? It was like, I think it was Spotify, um, like acapella musicals. And I was, you know, I was actually pretty inspired by that because I... I like hearing the creative uh, that comes out of kind of like acapella twists on instrumental right. and like the chord structures that are developed. Um, it's really fascinating. So that's actually one that's on my list right now that I've been listening to, which is kind of like this basically acapella, you know, no instrumental voice only, you know, musicals. Um That's that's not necessarily my regular playlist. 
but that is my that is my current one. Right, right, awesome. All right, I'll have to I'll I'll um get a, have to get a link from you at some point to put in that to anything yeah, in that yeah. category. Yeah, I have to find that. Awesome. Well, um, I certainly I feel like I've covered most of the topics I wanted to. Is there anything you want to add? Anything you want to promote? Anything like place people can find you or just anything you want to share? Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't do a lot of self promotion because um, I don't. It feels weird, but yep. <laughs> uh, it, it, if you liked this conver- conversation, you know, you can of course follow me at Seth Sandler. It's just my name on Twitter. Um, you, you'll find me there where I don't tweet that often, but um, I tweet on occasion. And then you know, if you're looking to um, either provide feedback or find a new tool for tuning a unique tuner unlike your you know $40 tuner or otherwise a unique tuner that you probably haven't experienced um, that's simpler that doesn't have a crazy amount of things all over the screen uh, check it out it's tunable um, tuner metronome recorder and session provider with scores um, so check that out um, and feel free to give me feedback or if you're hesitant in purchasing feel free to reach out and uh, we'll chat about it. Nice. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for this episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast and the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. You can learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon at patreon.com slash music ed tech talk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you a monthly video update with an app and music recommendation and tech tips section, including access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be. I hope to connect with you soon. See you next time.